Good afternoon. Two preliminary observations. The first is that if you've been here before when I've chaired panels, I normally assume the role of an exacerbator rather than a moderator. As I look at the personnel of the panel today, I don't think that'll be necessary. The second observation is because time is limited, I'm not going to make any more observations. The introductions are going to be abbreviated. If you want to know more about them, you can find it out later. <laughs> Many of you know Professor Richard Epstein, Thank you. New York University School of Law. I still have a hard time not saying Chicago. So do I. I guess, I guess you do too, yeah. Then Marty Regalia, the Senior Vice President and Chief Economist for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And then plunging bravely into the fray is Ms. Heather L. Slavkin, the Senior Legal and Policy Advisor for the Office of Investment, American Federation of Labor, and Congress of Industrial Organizations, AFL-CIO. Our topic, we didn't think this would be broad enough, uh, corporations, deficit reduction, and the role of the federal government in regulating business. <laughs> it if, is too small. If we miss anything, let us know. <laughs> We're not talking about bullying. We're going to let Richard plunge in first. No, I think it's Martin touch. And then we're going to hear from Ms. Slavkin. No, are you doing first? I'm sorry, Marty first. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mia culpa, mea culpa. We're going to hear from Marty first, then Ms. Slavkin, then Richard, then Ms. Slavkin again, and then I will pick at them while you all decide what questions you want to ask from the floor. Marty. Thank you very much. You know, as a, a non-lawyer, I... Uh, do they want to do it from up here? Okay, fine. Why anybody would want to put this face on tape, I really don't know. Look at people in another room, and they won't see it. Down. Like I say, as a non-lawyer, I've learned never to correct the judge, so I'll go in any order you want, sir. Um, <laughs> this is a, a great privilege and honor as an economist, a career economist, to be addressing so many lawyers in one room. Why, it's either the epitome, epitome of my career or a precursor of what I can expect in the afterlife for my evil deeds. <laughs> And to be seated to the right of Professor Epstein is... You're on my it, left. Is, well, I'm on your left, but as they look at us, I'm on the right. And uh, that is a distinct honor. Um, the, the topics today are so wide-ranging, I'm going to concentrate on a couple of them. First off, what is the role of the federal government with, the, with regard to the, the budget deficit uh, and the debt levels? And that's simple. Fix it. That's their job. Fix it. As an economist, we send... Uh, we send politicians to Washington uh, really to do one thing, to spend money. I mean, also to preserve and help and, and uh, keep the local economy safe that we're sending them out of. But we send them to Washington to spend money, to provide for the public good. Infrastructure, education, <coughs> national defense, things that the corporate economy and the private economy would not of their own accord pay for. So that's why they come here. The problem is they are supposed to prioritize that spending and then they're supposed to limit it and pay for it with a tax code that is as least deleterious to the overall economic growth as possible. That's the job. We don't send them here to redistribute. We don't send them here to promote pet peeves or, or to protect pet industries. They're here to legislate, spend, and tax in a way that allows the economy to grow. Our current fiscal situation is a debacle. We have debt to GDP ratios that are approaching 80% and climbing. If we do nothing, the only way we will get it under control is through massive tax increases in the next few years. And even then, we don't tip the, the uh, equation into uh, a complete fix. We just merely stabilize the debt level and kind of nudge it in the right direction. If we don't get the deficit under control, it will very quickly, within 10 years or so, rise to well in excess of 100%. And for economists, that's a very big trigger. There have been studies internationally that have looked at countries that run deficits to GDP that are somewhere around 90% or less. You don't seem to see much effect of the deficit on their growth rates. 
when you get to 90 percent and above, you see a progressively more serious impact on their long-run growth rates and on their standard of living. So we've got to get it under control now. Italy has 120 percent debt to GDP ratio. Greece, 160 percent debt to GDP ratio. We can probably handle a higher ratio than some countries because of the breadth and depth of our economy, but we can't just ignore it. And that's what we seem to have done. In the last year alone, we've been adding over a trillion dollars to the debt level. In 19, or in 2008, our debt to GDP ratio was about 42%. We had about $5 trillion worth of outside debt in the economy. Today, the outside debt in the economy is about $4 trillion higher than that, almost $9 trillion. And the total debt to GDP ratios are approaching 100%. That is to say, if you add in the inside debt and the outside debt, the social security debt and the like. So we are at kind of the cusp, and we have to get it under control. And the way you have to do that is through the spending side. Right now, uh, entitlement spending and interest costs are over 60% of outlays. And they're growing, and they're on autopilot. The discretionary side that is voted on every year is less problematic. And it's something that can be more directly controlled by Congress. But the automatic um, pieces of the budget, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest costs, are something that we simply must begin to address. And the addressing has to take the form of programmatic changes. Okay? It can't just be that we trim them at the edges. The program, programs have to be fundamentally reformed. Social Security is the easiest one. Um, but it's also not the, uh, not the biggest problem. Medicare is a bigger problem than Social Security. So that's what Congress has to do. And unfortunately, what Congress has done is punt repeatedly. Um, I guess it's just, you know, uh, uh, to use a, a sports analogy, I mean, they're just like the Redskins. They just punt repeatedly. <laughs> not very well. And not very well. I mean, we have a budget committee in both houses of Congress whose job it is to pass a budget. And for two years now, we haven't seen a budget. We have appropriations committees that look at the discretionary side every year. But the mandatory sides just roll on and on. So we have to make headway there. Our Congress decided to pass this ball to a super committee, which we like to call the 12 apostles. In fact, the 12 apostles looking for Judas. <laughs> because you've got to get seven votes to get this out of committee. And right now, Judas is proving very, very elusive. So we are heading towards a financial Armageddon if we don't get these under control. We've already seen the U.S. downgraded once. Um, there are threats to downgrade by the other rating agencies, and this, this, could, this will pyramid. One is not catastrophic. Two is not very good. Three, it starts to get very, very dicey. If int interest costs begin to rise, the interest section of the, of the outlays every year will balloon. It'll explode. So we have to get it under control. We have to do it now. On the regulatory side, we need regulations not to guide the financial system or to guide the free market system, but to prevent abuses and excesses. And the market system will do that on occasion. But the regulations have to be couched in such a way to affect the solution without imposing undue costs. Now, there are rules about cost and benefit analysis, but those rules are generally not followed and not required. So what happens is we get regulation upon regulation with no real cost benefit analysis. Recently, I was trying to hire a regulatory economist at the chamber, and I interviewed people from the agencies. One very nice gentleman came in. He was a PhD in physics. So I asked him, I said, what kind of economic approach do you use to estimating cost and benefit? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you're doing a cost-benefit analysis, kind of an economic thing, and uh, how do you estimate the cost and benefit of this? Oh, we don't do that. He said, in fact, I don't even have an economist working for me. This is the problem with the regulatory system. It's gone unbridled. It has blossomed. In the EPA alone, back in the 70s, we had about 500 pages of regulation. There's over 30,000 pages of regulation today. So the role of the government in the regulatory environment 
is to provide the regulations that you need to keep the system intact, to prevent the abuses, to address the abuses, and to address just market failures. But when you go in and you try to overregulate the system, you provide a tilt to the cost-benefit analysis, and you end up imposing more costs <coughs> than the benefits that are, re that are returned from the regulations themselves. So in a nutshell, Congress has to regulate, but they have to regulate wisely. They have to regulate appropriately, and they have to regulate in a way that makes economic sense. And overburdening an economy does nothing but slow it down. When you slow the economy down, you don't create jobs, you don't put people to work, you don't see productivity increases, and you don't see increases in the standard of living. And that's the situation we have right now. A stagnating economy, one that's growing but not growing fast enough, will not put people back to work, will not create jobs, and will not create long-term economic growth that drives productivity growth and an increase in the standard of living. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Now, Heather may have a slightly different take on some things. <laughs> Heather? A little shorter than him, Justice. All right. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me to participate today. I always look forward to the opportunity to talk to a group like this because it promises a lively conversation and it also promises to challenge the views that I hold and that I talk to friends day to day about and often, you know, I'm talking to people who share my perspective. So it's great to get feedback from folks like you so I can give my perspective some more thought and make sure that I'm, my analysis is on top of everything. So I am going to take the conversation a little bit of a different direction from where Marty took us. Um, I want to, uh, the focus of my work, first of all, the AFL-CIO is on financial regulation and financial regulatory reform. So of course my, my, my comments today are going to focus on the area that I know best. So I'd like to start by um, talking briefly about the history of financial regulation here in the United States and where we are today in the implementation of financial regulatory reform. And then I want to speak for just a moment about an idea that has implications for both regulation and fiscal policy here in the U.S. that's taken off in, uh, among progressive advocates both in the United States and internationally, and that's the financial transaction tax. <laughs> Um, so starting with the history of financial markets regulation, I want to go back to uh, before the Great Depression. In, in a time in the 1800s, the history of the United States was marked by bubbles and bursts. Um, prior to the Great Depression, we saw on average a financial crisis every 20 years. Um, there were five financial crises in the 1800s. There's a, there was another one in 1907 and then the Great Depression in 1929 through 1933. So by the time FDR came into office, it was clear that something had to be done so that we could restore investors' confidence in the economy and the stock market so that people would put their money into, into places with confidence that it was going to grow and that that money would be used to develop products and services that would, be, that would contribute to the economy here in the U.S. Um, so when FDR came in, there was a big conversation about how this needed to take place. Um, and the determination was that we needed structural reforms and we needed deposit insurance. And I think, you know, most of the people here in this room, if your lawyers are familiar with the Glass-Steagall Act, you know about the separation of banking from more risky activities like um, securities underwriting and insurance. Um, so, and I think the, the underlying philosophy behind structural regulation in the financial markets was that, was that we, the, the government decided that bank runs every 20 or so years are just not good for our economy. And as a result, they decided that we needed a system of deposit insurance because commercial banking is so essential. It's an essential lifeblood of, of, of the U.S. economy. So in exchange for this government backing that was explicit, the banks were going to have to accept some limitations on their ability to engage in excessively risky activity that would make the need to fall back on government for FDIC insurance less likely. So we had these structural reforms. They were put in place throughout the 1930s and uh, into the 1940s. And we didn't have a financial crisis for over 40 years. And then um, in the early 1980s, we thought that we had overcome our um, previous excesses and that we were the 
people were smart enough to avoid bubbles and busts again, and we were all wonderfully rational people who um, who didn't have emotional reactions to market activities, and we could start dismantling the, the regulatory structure here in the U.S. Um, there were a couple minor um, changes passed at the federal level in the early 1980s that impacted states' ability to protect consumers in uh, consumer lending transactions. And then in 1982, there was the Garn St. Germain Act, which allowed uh, out-of-state banks to purchase failed banks. Um, and that began a, a process of, of deregulation at the federal level, which culminated in the gramm leach Act of 1999. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, we also saw the reemergence of financial crises. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it was solely because of the dismantling of financial regulation. I, I do think that globalization, that computerization of financial markets had an impact on this. But we did see the SNL crisis. We saw long-term capital management. We saw the tech bubble and bust. And then, of course, the big mortgage meltdown and, and all of the implications of that and fallout from that that began in 2007. So when President Obama came into office, there was this perspective that something had to be done. The, the taxpayers had, had put up $700 billion to prevent the financial system from, from falling off the tracks. And th there became a fight in Washington, and I think that fight is still playing out today. And it was between two competing perspectives, the perspective of whether we should re implement, we should have a new New Deal that goes back to the structural separation of, of commercial banking from more risky investment activities, or whether we should have a more supervisory form of regulation in the U.S. where where regulators have the ability to kind of lurk around the edges and look in on various actors in the financial markets and, and jump in when they see a problem arising. And this, this competition of ideologies played out in the Dodd-Frank legislation, what we saw was that, the, that Congress sort of punted to the regulators. When they implemented Dodd-Frank, they didn't make very many final decisions, and they left most of the hard decisions about how their ideas about how the financial market should work would actually be put into practice by the regulators. And I think that's part of the problem that we're seeing today, and part of the confusion and part of the uncertainty, is that nobody really knows exactly what Dodd-Frank did or what it's going to do. Um, and we're still, we're still seeing that play out, and it, it's, to my mind, and I'm somebody who works in this area day to day, it's still very unclear to me what it's going to mean and whether we're going to have structural reform or whether we're going to have um, the, the supervisory government that magically flies in when a problem arises and acts like Superman and makes it go away. Um, and I, or whether we're going to see some sort of combination of the two. So that's where we are today on financial regulatory reform. I want to talk briefly dealing on the deficit issue and um, about the financial transaction tax, which is a big idea that there have been folks in, in the U.S. and Europe talking about, for, well, since Tobin first proposed it many years ago, but there have been financial transaction taxes in place for many, many years. Um, there were financial transaction taxes in the U.S. The SEC um, imposes one that helps funds it, fund its operations, but it's very small. Um, and the idea behind the financial transaction tax is that this tiny tax could be imposed on trading of stocks, bonds, options, derivatives. The proposal that came out um, that Senator Harkin and Representative Fazio released last week would be 0.03%. So that's $3 on every $10,000 of trading, which could raise $352 billion over 10 years. This is an idea that progressive let progressives like because it's a progressive tax. It'll fall a lot more on the people who are doing more stock market trading, um, and it will have almost no impact on people who don't have any money and aren't investing at all. Um, and it's tiny, and it can raise lots of money that can be used to help pay off the deficit, that can preserve Social Security or other programs that people really like. Um, and it has support both in the U.S. and internationally. Um, it also has a, a potential regulatory impact. One of the problems we're seeing right now in the financial markets is that there's a lot of volatility in day-to-day -day trading, and a lot of economists have come out and said that they believe that if you were to impose a financial transaction tax, you would diminish um, high-frequency trading tremendously because the benefit that you that the that the traders get the potential income would be offset by the tax, and so they would no longer have the incentive to get involved in these markets. 
So um, that was all I was planning to talk about for, for today. Um, I thank you guys for this round. Yes, I guess I'll be back up. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. We have promised her another crack at the subjects after yeah. Richard. Richard, I'm right in introducing you this time. Now it's your turn. Well, thank you. I mean, now I have to figure out what to say because there's been so much that's going on in this small and tender topic that I'm not sure where I would like to begin. But I, I think I'm going to talk about this in a somewhat different way, which is the relationship between structural reforms on the one hand and tax reforms on the other, or other financing reforms. And this is the current position that I would take. Um, we are not going to enter into a second New Deal when we try to do the third New Deal, the first one being Woodrow Wilson. Uh, we are entering into a situation where government is already running <coughs> presently about 25% of our resources, borrowing 40% of the money that it needs, and that the first thing that we have to do is to find a way in which to slay the dragon. Many years ago, Aaron Waldowski, when he spoke about this, said, Richard, people like you who believe in prudent adjudication will always fail. And what he meant by that is if you simply say that we're going to trim each and every program pro rata, like through the deficit committee and so forth, what will happen is you will have gridlock and stasis and nothing will take place. He says if you really want to make a change, <clears throat> you must slay the dragon. You must figure out which particular kinds of programs you're prepared to exterminate so that you will never see them again and which of those things you're prepared to keep on life support. Well, in my view, that's where we have to start. And so here's where Ms. Slavkin and I, I think, disagree in the most profound way. Um, she announces this tax, and it's always put in the same fashion. It's a very small tax which raises a huge amount of money. So it's $350 billion to us, but it's only 0.03 cents per $10,000 or $3 or whatever it is to everybody else. Um, what happens under that circumstance is, is it has the following disastrous, in my view, public choice arrangements, wholly apart from whatever disruption it creates in liquidity and markets. We need fundamental reform, and we will not get fundamental reform if what we do is we increase the tax structure and use it to essentially support and to maintain the kinds of failed institutions that we already have placed in the United States everywhere else. Uh, so let me see if I could explain this a little bit more clearly. Um, we now have one source of the budget deficits, of course, are the various stimulus programs that are being put forward. And I would like to say that I was a died in the world Keynesian and believe that you get out of liquidity traps by stimulating demand. Um, I would argue that point because I think in general it's the regulatory environment that matters more. But I think it's extremely important in this point to stress the fact that we never have in the United States today naked stimulus programs. They are always larded on with all sorts of other long-term reforms, which essentially one after another manage to wreck this, that, or the other industry. So if you start to go back to the financial disorganizations in September 2008, somehow or other financial reform managed to include a situation where you had the Wellstone situation, which mandated mental health coverage with respect to standards kinds of insurance plan. If you look at the current president's uh, job bill, I, I described it once as something which made me weep when I started to read it, you will see in effect that the first infrastructure provisions all have buy American provisions, which is another form of American protectionism done to protect big business and yes, to protect big labor. It has a Davis-Bacon in there. It's got a new form of anti-discrimination law in there. It has a way of trying to cap um, charitable deductions. It contains a series of grotesque allocations provisions for a new infrastructure authority and so forth. So that what's really going on in this particular situation is that the Keynesians cannot even implement their own program of trying to essentially get out of a recession by using government spending because as you push the money in the economy at one end, what happens is you take it out of the economy in the other end by a series of low and middle level interventions. So my first point is, I think in this particular case, is that we have to have a moratorium on any new kind of regulatory program whatsoever. And that includes <laughs> everything which is tied to stimulus programs. That is, uh, Mr. Keynes did not worry very much, or Keynes worry about public choice, but I think we really have to do that. And once we understand the way in which the political dynamic goes, we have to fight the kind of bundling type situation. Because the clear implication of all of this is, even if you were to get this stimulus program to work, which I very much doubt would have much effect, and the evidence is hopelessly mixed, 
What you're doing is you're depleting the long-term industrial base of the United States because of the following temporal differences. The stimulus program lasts by definition for a year because nobody could keep you on steroids forever, but the regulatory returns, they last forever. So to go back to the stimulus program of 1937 and 1938, that came at exactly the same time <clears throat> we had the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the Civil Aeronautics Act. These were great years in the New Deal. All of them were monopolizing institutions of one form or another. The stimulus comes and go, and all of those regulatory programs start to remain. If you believe, as I do, in a theory of rational expectations, what it means is you can fool people in the private side once, but you can't fool them twice. When they start to see the short-term <laughs> stimulus are coupled with long-term measures which are systematically designed to undermine the long-term financial stability of the United States economy, they're not going to be amused and they're not going to be impressed. Uh, it turns out that this dynamic is not just a domestic dynamic. Uh, what happens is we're going into the teeth of a gale, and the ability to attract either labor or capital from overseas into the United States is going to be diminished. The prospect of having some sort of foreign exit is going to be greater. So what is it that we try to do about this? In our brilliant way, we try to combine all the Keynesian talk associated with aggregate demand with a fairly massive program for income redistribution by trying to pile higher taxes on the richest segment of the population on the grounds that somehow or other they will never miss the money, whereas everybody else, again, will desperately long to have it. My view about all of this is that, again, it is a kind of a fool's errand. When we cut the capital gains taxes in 2003, we had a huge amount of increase in revenues coming in from the top 1 or 2 percent, $313 billion to over double that amount. From 2007 or 2009 to the present, there's been a major decline in the amount of revenues that we've been able to extract from the top. And if the stock market continues to work the way in which it is, we will have a double whammy. Rich people will actually lose somewhat more in the short run than poorer people because they are asset rich and the amount of revenue that you'll be able to get from a once reliable source will start to disappear. So if you look at the whole kind of package that's going on here, what we really have to do is to change our entire conception of the way in which we do business. And the first thing we have to do is to understand that the neoclassical critiques of monopoly are much more powerful than the Keynesian arguments one way or another about the use of the dangers associated with a program of financial stimulus. And so therefore, deregulation top to bottom has to be our first priority. And I could think of lots of ways in which to do it by getting rid of all of the new efforts and to repeal a lot of the statutes that are amended. So my view is I would repeal every one of the New Deal statutes as fast as I possibly could. <laughs> And, you know, that means the National Labor Relations Act, it means the Fair Labor Standards Act, it means the agricultural subsidies, it means getting rid of ethanol stuff. And then with respect to those areas where I think there is a serious regulatory need, but nonetheless huge regulatory excesses, I would try to get people in, regu in regulation who understand what they're trying to do, and that means a top-to-bottom revision of people running the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, OSHAs, and so forth, because the point that was made by Marty is in fact correct. If you don't know how to do a cost-benefit analysis and you don't think it matters, you will always get it wrong. So what we're doing in effect is we are suffering, I think, from a series of multiple ills and that what we have now are a series of multiple programs, all of which will accentuate the ills that we are going to face. So my prediction is that this particular program that I'm putting forward, modest as it is in scope and intention, <laughs> uh, <laughs> will in fact occasion a modest bit of resistance from people on the other side of the political spectrum. And so what you do is you're going to have yourself some kind of a gridlock. And gridlock at this particular point is not good enough. Um, you have to remember that you know the New Deal took the public sector from roughly 6 to 9 percent of the economy. Right now, uh, the Obama administration and the Republicans working in tandem have managed to get it from 20 to 25 percent of the economy over a period of three years or so. At the same time, you have a shrinking tax base. And at the same time, we have yet more entitlement programs that are being proposed, including most recently by the President, one with respect to higher education as a kind of a natural right for all citizens. So what we have to do is to simply banish the notion that positive rights, that restrictions on gains from trade, that high tariffs, that strong monopolies and neither capital or labor can do things, and start to liberalize in the 19th century sense so we don't have to face in the 21st century the kind of liberalization that I fear is all too common in Washington today. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. We had originally allotted five minutes to Heather to speak back to Richard. However, I realize she doesn't talk nearly as fast as he does. <laughs> so uh, take seven or eight minutes if you would like, yeah. Heather. <laughs> um, where do I begin? Um, probably with a lot of points that you guys will disagree with. <laughs> um, Let's see. let's see. Let's start with the argument that the public sector has moved from 20 to 25 percent of the economy. I, I'm sure that's right, but I think part of the reason that we've seen that happen is because the private sector has declined dramatically as a result of the financial crisis. So when the private, private sector declines and the public se sector stays the same size, then the public sector naturally becomes a bigger portion of the economy. And I think, you know, Mr. Epstein raises some, some valid points about, about trust in government and about the role of, of government and regulation, but I think a lot of what we've seen play out in the regulatory framework is that we have regulators who no longer believe in regulation and who, who aren't doing the jobs they're meant to, and a lot of time aren't, aren't funded to do the jobs that they're supposed to do. We have a situation right now um, where the CFTC was just given a $280 trillion new market that it's supposed to oversee in derivatives, and even Mitt Romney admits that derivatives, are, uh, derivatives should be regulated. Um, yet the House of Representatives is trying to cut their budget. So how are they supposed to do this? When we set people up for failure, they're not going to be successful. And we're going to be disappointed with the outcome of their action. Um, let's go back to repealing every one of the, the New Deal standards. <laughs> um, deposit insurance. Does everybody in this room think we should repeal deposit insurance? Wow. I didn't say that one, by the way. I, <laughs> I talked what? about the labor regulation. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think that if you were to repeat, if you want to create a bank run, repeal deposit insurance. That's my reaction to that. Because I think a lot of our largest commercial banks in this country right now are undercapitalized, are, are technically insolvent. And the only reason that they're still standing is because because the depositors believe that the government is going to back them up. And if we were to take away that, that deposit insurance, and the, then the depositors would pull their money out of those financial institutions and we would have a real crisis on our hands. It may be that that crisis is what we need to wake people up and to open people's eyes to, to propel the change that's necessary in our economy, but I think that deposit insurance is something that is, is fundamental and is sort of scary to think about taking away. Um, let's talk about the cost-benefit analysis for a moment. Um, this is an argument that's become very prevalent in the regulatory reform conversation, and I appreciate the attractiveness of wanting to perform cost-benefit analyses in every and all situations. But I think we're, when you talk to the American people about the cost of the financial crisis, they're not concerned about how much it costs a bank to prevent predatory lending or how much it would have cost AIG to implement some, some basic protocols to prevent making or writing credit default swaps that they didn't understand what they were getting into. Um, we have $700 billion in underwater home equity in this country right now. I mean, these are the sorts of costs that I look at when I think of the cost of a financial crisis that can't even compare. To, to the cost of implementing financial reform. And when we, when we harp on, on the cost-benefit analysis of every individual piece of regulation that we're asking the regulators to, to implement, what we're forgetting is, is that the, the regulatory reform that was passed and that I don't claim for a moment was perfect was part of a broad framework and a broad fabric that's supposed to work together. And there's no way to calculate the potential benefit of one piece of that regulation in isolation. So those are the points that I was hoping to, to get at. <laughs> I've already got a challenger. Well, yeah. uh, thank you, Heather. I think there are floor mics on each side. Looking into these bright lights, I'm not certain. but. I think there are. Is there. Are there questions? Richard, you had something else to say first. Yeah, okay. I, I do want to say a couple of things. Um, one of them about the, the question about federal deposit insurance. I, I think it's very important, Heather, to distinguish between whether you wanted it in an original position 
or whether you want to keep it out so it can be done by private mechanisms and whether or not you want to withdraw it after it's already in place. It's much more reckless to do the second than it is to do the first. And the theoretical debate, I think, is much closer on the first because you're right to say that there may have been more of these crises before uh, the Fed came in there. But the biggest one in 1929 was, of course, induced and regulated in part by government money. And I think the pattern has been that we now have maybe fewer of these crises, but they tend to be deeper um, by virtue of the fact that you have government regulations and no sorts of private correction. And, and the second thing I wanted to mention is on the home mortgage stuff, this is an exact example where every piece of regulation is in completely the opposite direction. You cannot allow unrealized losses to go unrealized and hope that either banks or individuals will rationalize the market. I said this in 2008, I'm going to say it now, unless you are heartless, you essentially have no heart. And what I mean by that is you must have a very strong regime of strict foreclosure. Banks must be forced to regulate the stuff. Once the market does that, then it will re-equilibrate at a lower price. Once you get tenants who are essentially now trying to milk the property, will stop its rapid depreciation in terms of its physical condition. Once you introduce something like the HAM program, you will get 90 to 95 percent failure rates out of these things. This is one of these mid-level sort of benevolent type of situation which has produced an unparalleled disaster in the housing market in which we spend all our time worrying about whether paper was put out in the right form and none of our time worrying about whether people are in default. So this is a classic case in which I think of short-term sentiment creating long-term chaos within the market. So on that issue, I feel quite violently, I, I would like to say about this, and I don't care how unfashionable I am in this or any other room. I'm going to give Heather a chance to uh, respond before I start calling on people at the <laughs> four mics. Heather? Um, I actually agree with several of the points that Richard made. I think that the importance of requiring the banks to mark their, their books accurately is incredibly vital in order to get through the, the current crisis and the overhang that we're dealing with and the inability to get our economy moving again. We have to force the banks to, to recognize that the, loss, the losses that they have sitting on their books. They're just, as long as they continue to deny, to extend and pretend, they're not going to start making the loans that need to be made to small businesses that are trying to grow and create jobs. We're continuing to have this problem in the housing market that we can't get through. I, I agree with Richard on this point. Um, I also agree that HAMP was a failure. Um, I still believe that there should be some opportunities for homeowners who can afford to pay a mortgage to modify that mortgage at, in a way that maximizes the net present value to investors so that it's economically sound for all, all parties involved. But if someone can't afford to pay their mortgage, they shouldn't be in their home. Good you <laughs> uh, Marty, did you, have, did you have a comment? I, I have a, a couple of very quick ones. First, you know, in the I'm kind of a numbers guy, and so it bothers me when people stand up and say you know, the American taxpayer sent $700 billion on TARP, which they didn't. They spent 200 on the banks. The banks paid it all back with interest uh, and more because they paid back on the, on the warrants. Um, the rest of it, a uh, big chunk went to AIG. That's still up in the air. The stuff that's a net loss, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, even the auto companies that received uh, chunks of TARP money are starting to pay it back. So to sit there and say the American taxpayer spent $700 billion is just factually incorrect. The other thing that's interesting is that one of the markets that was more heavily regulated throughout uh, the, the last 100 years has been the housing market. And the housing market is responsible for one of the biggest failures. So if you're going to sit there and say we need regulation to prevent these kind of market abuses and failures, then let's look at where, where the regulation actually caused the market failure. And the underwriting in the housing market, I mean, the, the idea that the government can run a subprime loan. I t talk to businesses all over the country, and I don't know any business that goes out there and advertises a subprime product. I mean, I go to hamburger joints and I don't see a big sign, buy subprime beef. I go to some place else and I don't see, you know, buy clothes with holes in them, subprime clothing, you know. I just don't see it. But in the housing market, boom, right out there, subprime loan. Why? Because the government pushed it. Because the government in this country wanted those loans made. I agree that they should write uh, and mark to market appropriately, and I believe 100% of what Richard said, so I'll join the Cretan Society with you, um, in that if you can't 
allow these foreclosures to take place and you don't encourage them, in fact, to take place, you're never going to get a clearing in the market. You're never going to get a resurrection in the housing market. And right now, the only thing that's holding mm -hmm. this country back, or the biggest thing, is the fact that there's $6, tr $6 trillion in, in real asset loss in the housing market that has reduced homeowner wealth, and that's what's killing consumption, and that's what's not driving the economy. And the last thing is, you know, if we're going to all get holy about marking the market and, and, and uh, appropriately reflecting the books, then why the heck doesn't the federal government do it on their budget? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And in fact, the transfer payments have displaced the capital assets as a source of deficits, which has very powerful long-term implications. I'm going to arbitrarily and capriciously allot three more minutes to Heather, and then I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I just want to clarify that I was careful to say in talking about TARP that the taxpayer put up $700 billion, and not that they spent $700 billion, because I understand that a lot of that money has come back. Um, and with regard to, to housing, I think that there's a lot of people are talking past each other in, in this area. Banks are heavy, heavily regulated, but a lot of the most of the subprime mortgages were written by unregulated financial institutions. Um, there were regulations related to um, to fair lending that were passed by Congress in 2001, but the Federal Reserve failed to implement those rules into, until 2008, when it was clear that the subprime mortgage market was already bursting. So we need not just laws to be in place to protect bars, but we need regulators that believe in the obligation to, to, protect, to protect consumers as well. But we have Fannie and Freddie. Let me kind of make just one observation. I heard Christopher Dodd I speak. hope I'll get to the floor. Excuse me, go ahead. <laughs> um, this is after he's out of office, so beyond punishment. He said, well, what about, I asked him, or somebody asked him, what about, why didn't you do anything to take on Fannie and Freddie in the way in which they worked? And you know what the answer was? We didn't have time to do that. Um, uh, what it really means is we'll go after the private guys, but this is a classic illustration where the government may not have initiated these loans, but to the extent that it either buys or guarantees them, it completely perverts the underlying market. It's about $150 billion or so forth losses and counting. And the current administration's proposal is to revive exactly that, either through the FHA or for something else. So I mean, this is a case in which hope springs eternal, that somehow or other, if you make a lot of bad bets are uh, that you'll come out ahead. <laughs> okay, <now>. Diversification. <laughs> are there mics on both sides or just on this side? Just over here? Okay, we'll hear the first. State who you are, please, and then your question. Yeah, I'm comment. Brian Bishop from uh, Rhode Island. And uh, Heather, may, it might be age-related, but if I follow your history, you may be the only one who didn't think that the Carter years were a crisis. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, uh, the, uh, but I, the real question, actually, because there are two fans of stimulus on the panel, which surprised me. Uh, fans? Well, uh, at least uh, uh, who accede to the, co the possible testing of the concept if we keep regulation off the side. But Mike, one of the concerns I have is even looking to the nostalgic uh, vision of, of stimulus, what I've seen in Rhode Island is we have a major bridge on 95 that's closed to truck traffic major bridge up and down the East Coast. That can't be touched because it's not shovel-ready, and they're using the stimulus money to repave roads that don't need repaving. And, and I'm wondering where, because I think a lot of, uh, 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 certainly a lot of labor, and I don't know the, the extent to which that's reflected within your own ranks, uh, is working on these stimulus projects, and I would think they would be upset by the shovel-ready concept. I mean, do you want to tell your grandchildren uh, 100 years from now, you know, this is the, or sorry, 30 years, 35 years from now, <laughs> that, that this is the highway that got repaved during the great mortgage crisis? Or would we look to rather large and impressive things that we could say the government at least did something that we could look at and, pra and, and praise the architecture or something in, in hindsight? Right. Yeah, we'll go to Heather first on that. I think it was more directed to her. Sure. I, I think, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, the question is, should the stimulus money have gone towards big, impressive projects versus paving roads? No. I, I, is, is that right? It was a little more subtle than that. I mean, the <laughs> roads that are being paved aren't due to be paved, but it doesn't take a lot of red, it doesn't take a lot of red tape to repave a road. They're doing stuff that doesn't need to be done. 
what happens is the permit system essentially directs the spendage of money to the places where you don't need it. And what you need under these circumstances is a kind of fundamental lobotomy of the EPA and the, <laughs> no, and the precautionary principle because what happens is every imagined risk is a real one. And so what happens is the examination to try to get these projects through are simply disastrous. This is a classic case where the common law rule is much, much better. What it says is, look, you don't need any preclearance from us to do anything, but the moment there's an actual failure, an imminent danger, we're shutting you down. Thank you. And what will happen is 99% of these cases will go through without a hitch, and maybe 1% of them will end up in litigation. Yeah, what I we do here is have a level of redundancy. And what the point of the question was is it redirects resources to things that you don't need because you don't have to have permits on them, whereas if you're in an industrial area like Rhode Island happens to be, you've got to do it. When they had the wreck of the of uh, the Santa Monica Freeway in California some years ago because of the earthquake, they suspended the normal rules of pre-approval. And instead of having a system which took six years to do it, they got it done in four and a half months because they gave them an incentive contract where they got bonuses for every day they beat six months, and they managed somehow or other to get 90 days off that time. So you're talking about essentially 10 to 1 differences in a point And this is true on every single thing that the EPA does, is that it moves first and thinks second. What it ought to do is to go to sleep until somebody wakes them up, and we will be a, with a real problem, and we will be much better off in the way we do it. I, I, and by the way, the union guy should be absolutely in favor of this. You by now realize why I said we don't need an exacerbator on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> but I will no, give I mean, she's in agreement. to uh, get a word in edgewise. Here. I, I mean, I think it's, it's hard to dispute the point that we would much rather see big projects that we can point to when our grandchildren are around and say, you know, this is, this is how we put people to work during the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and there apparently has been some bureaucracy that's prevented those big projects from coming to fruition, and I share your frustration with that. Well, but, but it's, not, it's not just this is how we put people to work. That's, that's the mentality. That, that Washington has that's just dead wrong. It's get out of the way and let the market put people to work. Right now, there are 350 projects in every state of the union around the country that aren't being done because of permitting problems that would immediately employ people, all private projects. There's a huge pipeline that's being proposed to bring a, a, a shale crew down to uh, refineries on the Gulf Coast that isn't being done because of permitting problems. If you just got the permitting problems out of the way, the private sector would finance it and the private sector would build it and the private sector would create jobs. And it's not that you don't believe in environmental protection. Rich folks like the people in this room love environmental protection when it's not a waste. But what you have to do is to time the remedy. And you know these things about timing and frequency of remedies may seem like small details, but essentially they're worth 95% of the total pot. And on this issue, of course, labor's the same way. Uh, they benefit if you could get these jobs. And also, I, I want to say again about getting people back to work, one of the great mistakes about the Keynesian system is that it's willing to say, well, so long as you spend money to get people back to work, it doesn't matter whether you're first dig a hole and then fill it up again, or whether you build something useful. I want to get people back to work, but I want them to get to work to create capital assets rather than to doing the other thing. And what the permitting system does is it puts you in the wrong direction on this issue. So there's just fierce misallocations, and there's nobody whatsoever in the environmental department who thinks about any non-environmental issue. They are single objective peak function guys, and when you think that way, you always get everything completely wrong. The level of incompetence that drives that operation is simply staggering to anybody who one cares about a market, cares about an environment, and knows something about technique. Yeah. I didn't catch any very direct swipes at Labor or at Heather personally, so I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Ruben Borchardt from uh, New York City Lawyers Chapter. My question is for Ms. Slavkin. Uh, regarding the uh, FDIC, uh, you seem to believe that there would be, uh, you know, uh, no. No, no insurance of any sort if there was no uh, FDIC. The, we have private insurance in every, uh, every possible thing you, you can think of, right? Uh, life, fire, uh, flood. Um, you don't believe that if the feds got out of the business of insuring uh, banks, uh, bank deposits, then there wouldn't be private companies stepping in the market? And my second real quick question is, can you please define predatory lending? 
Okay. Um, I'll start with predatory lending question because it's quick and easy. Um, I would define predatory lending in a variety of ways. Um, making loans to people who you know can't repay them with terms that you know they don't understand. Um, and based on appraisals that are falsified. So I think any of those aspects would define predatory lending. Does the government bear any, uh, any guilt for that, for saying you have to lend to people uh, just because of the color of their skin or you know, it's discrimination otherwise, um, you know, rather than only considering whether or not they can repay it? There's a whole variety of other factors. Uh, you have to give a certain percentage of your, of your loans to poor people, people that may have you know, certain She's skin color. I, I know, but I think that's that's a miscon that's a misinterpretation of the implications of, of the Community Reinvestment Act, which creates incentives to to loan to low and moderate income families, but does not have any quotas per se. Mm. Per se, but but wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't government student loans be predatory lending then? Because nobody <laughs> expects those to be paid back. Um, on, <laughs> on the FDIC question, or on, on, the, <laughs> on the question of deposit insurance, I think that, that the issue there is that deposit insurance becomes necessary at a time of extreme financial crisis. And it, the need for deposit insurance ebbs and flows. What's different between deposit insurance and other types of insurance is that you can predict um, with relative accuracy, the, the amount of money that it's going to cost to protect against fire or flood. But when a deposit, when the need for deposit insurance comes, it comes fast and furious, and it has the potential to overwhelm the private sector. And I don't think I think that the idea is that you want to avoid creating a financial crisis by putting deposit insurance in the private sector. Go ahead, Richard. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, look, on fast and furious, the flood market, of course, is notorious for exactly the same characteristics. The government programs have been abject failure. What you want is private insurance accurately priced with reinsurance markets and international markets to start to deal with it. On the predatory pricing stuff, Heather, I actually agree with your definition, but I think that uh, there's some piece missing in the analysis. What you say is you make a loan to somebody which you know that they can't repay and you falsify the data. If, in fact, this were just a private transaction, why would you lend your money to somebody who cannot repay it on the strength of a falsified transaction? And the answer is the definition of, if it's just a two-party transaction that you have there, is that the definition of a predatory loan is where you try to make sure that your customer loses $10,000 so that you can lose $100,000. And, you know, that's not a long-term stable equilibrium. So <laughs> why is it that you have these three combinations? Because there's somebody else who's going to buy this paper at par or guarantee it at par. And once you do that, it's no longer predatory lending in the sense that you've described. It's falsification to cheat the government to make sure that they will pay the paper. And since the government guys are so easy, eager to put these things outside the door, what happens is they accept the fraud knowingly. So that it's not fraud on the government, it's fraud by the government and the industry on the American public at large. And that is what happened. It happened with Fannie and Freddie Mae. And as you well know, in the 2005 and 2006 periods, when you're trying to get equality of racial participation in these programs, and you know that the risk profiles are different, you're going to have to have greater risk from your minority members and from your standard, you know, standard or ordinary white people of one kind or another. That's going to translate into a rate of this particular source. So if my view is, I can understand the argument for race-based subsidies in some sense, I mean, you know, for political thing, but the one thing you must understand about it is if you want to have that debate, it has to be explicit, it has to be above board, and the worst way to do subsidies is to give guarantees that are not priced at the time that they're issued for the liabilities that are undisclosed at that particular point in time. So if you have the moral convictions about redistribution on these things, you have to say it. And the problem is when you put it in this particular fashion, you bury it, and then everybody, white and black, and Hispanic has to pick up the pieces when you're all done. So I, I think, in effect, that as you define predatory lending, it's a non-problem unless you have a government. I just want to say, I think, though, that misconstrues the history to a certain extent uh, on subprime mortgage lending, because Fannie and Freddie were not in the market until 2006. And the, the huge uptick in, in predatory or in subprime lending happened in 2001, 2003. 2000, by the time Fannie and Freddie got into the market, mm -hmm. most, of the, or most of the subprime loans had already been made. But, but how much of that was guaranteed by government under other programs like FHA? 
I don't have the exact number. I think the answer is, I think something like 50 to 60 percent of the market had the government footprint over it, over the relevant periods. And the other point, by the way, which we didn't mention is, the other thing, of course, that goes wrong, you have a strong Fed, and it sets the wrong interest rate, then you're going to create the bubble independent of guarantees. And so what happened in this particular period is you have people printing out cheap money. The only way you could get the cheap money is to borrow to buy a home, so you'll bid up the price of the complementary asset to the point where the total package gets you a competitive rate of return, and you can get a lot of disaster that way. So again, you know, it's you're living by the sword and you're dying by the sword. You get these guys who prevent a lot of small risk, and they create a lot of systematic big risk. It's not sure which way you go. So put the two things together, and you now have yet a second way in which it turns out that misguided government regulation by pricing money incorrectly, vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the Taylor rule and so forth, can create these sorts of problems. We should have another question. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, I, I actually agree with what you said, but I wanted to add two points. Okay. On, on the home mortgage issue, you have to add on top of that two additional factors. The fact that of uh, the, the preferential tax treatment for home mortgages. Oh, I'm against that. And, um, Except for rich people. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the impact of declining wages and the need for people to find some sort of low interest borrowing um, to compensate for their inability to spend. Yeah, through. which means you want to open up the banking system. And of course, what they've done with credit card reform and debit card reform is to shut these things down in the last two years. It's a classic illustration of progressive forms gone away. That is, uh, after the Durban Amendment fiasco and the credit card fiasco, it's pretty clear that most people predict an increase in the number of unbanked people. Um, that will take place because they can't figure out what the fee structures are, they won't get their free checking accounts anymore, and so it's off to God knows where. By fiat, that question is over. Next huh. question. <laughs> uh, Mario Loyola, Texas Public Policy Foundation. I just, two quick points, well, a point and a question. Uh, my, my point just is on, is on the issue of the cost-benefit analysis, and Ms. Lafkin seemed to say, well, what are these, and correct me if I'm wrong, but to paraphrase your, your, how you address this is, um, you know, what are, what are these compliance costs to businesses compared to what the society as a whole has suffered and what it what it's potentially stands to suffer? I think that our, our point precisely is, what are the losses that people actually stand to suffer compared to these huge compliance costs that we're imposing on businesses, which turn out to be enormous costs that are being imposed on the society as a whole? I mean, when, when the EPA issues a rule that costs businesses $90 billion to comply with, that's, that's a cost that you're imposing on the society as a whole. It's often worse than a tax because it doesn't even generate revenue. And so the point that we're making is, Who's you know, we? We, we, the point that we're making is, you know, this, this, this application of the precautionary principle has gone from the absurd to the truly insane. And, and you know, where we're imposing huge costs on the society as a whole to prevent, you know, to, 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 to eliminate truly marginal risks of loss to really small populations of people. It? I'm sorry? Is this going to have a question in it? It, it does have a question at the end. <laughs> but I just want to make the point of, of, you know, do we, is there, is there a, a cultural, do we have a cultural problem with this unrestrained application of the precautionary principle? Is that something that people on the pro-regulation side worry about or have any standards uh, for, for measuring and for being self-critical about. That's, that's my first question. My, and my second that's question that's is... Question. My, my second, else my, will have the next question. Well, my, no, no, but my, my second question is a quicker one, which is the same question sort of applied to the right. Aren't there regulations that conservatives should like? And, and one that I have in mind is one that increases transparency and information uh, across a, a level playing field, such as the securities regulations of 33 and 34. And I'd like to ask, uh, Professor Epstein, if he'd address those regulations Absolutely. and whether we have... But Heather, I'll put that's a <laughs> Heather first. Thanks. So, responding to the question of whether the progressive pro-regulation movement um, has uh, internal conversations about whether a regulation goes too far, absolutely we do. And if you look at, at comment letters that Americans for Financial Reform has, to, has submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission and the CFTC on a variety of regulatory proposals, you'll see that there are certain areas where we say, you know, in this instance, we just don't think this makes sense. Um, so we definitely have those conversations. I do have to say, though, that at this moment in, in history, the, the circumstances under which we take that position are few and far between. Yes. Um, um, yeah, my, my answer is, first of all, I think there is some imprecision in the definition of what counts as a compliance cost. I do not regard complying with an FD or an EPA regulation as a compliance cost, as that term is commonly understood, 
I think that compliance, for example, in the banking industry means you have to have internal audits to make sure that external rules are going to be followed and that it turns out in that particular industry compliance costs exceed lending costs at this particular point in terms of the kind of audit functions you have. And clearly there's something about that balance which is deeply wrong because the cost of compliance are going to have to be spread out over the loans and that means you're going to go to lower risk loans and lots of other things of that sort. Now, the question asked to me was about what do I think about securities regulation in general. And, and, and I think, in effect, I have the following basic response, which is you have two choices to the question of how you protect the small investors. Uh, one of them is to tell them to spend 1.2 percent of their assets to invest through Fidelity or Vanguard or one of the other funds. And the other thing is to start an SEC. A and my view is that what we really ought to do, particularly today when there are all sorts of financial intermediaries, is to say to anybody who wants to invest his own money on his own time, abandon hope all ye who enter here. You either play on the fast track or you do not play at all because you have this other alternative. What the SEC does through its endless amounts of regulations and disclosures, which are mandated to provide you what we call boilerplate, that which is necessary to avoid liability but gives you no information, is, <laughs> is strictly an artifact of, of an older system in which you thought that small investors were the soul of the market. Intermediation transforms this business entirely. And, and so what we should do with respect to the SEC is if at most there may be some kind of accounting requirements that you need, which I think private parties could probably supply and audit as well, but to recognize that in the 21st century, um, a set, what you really want to do is to have professionals on the track and small people with fiduciary duties in their favor from those professionals and think of the SEC as being largely redundant. I mean, why on earth would I want to get in paper all of these statements six months late about what the state of a commercial corporation is when in fact any Anything that you want, you could ask a corporation to put online tomorrow and have people access it. So it's, it's really, I think, in effect, a classic case of regulatory obsolescence that has been created by a bureaucracy which is so entrenched on stopping all things that don't matter that the matter of thing takes place. Okay, the second point is the one form of regulation that they did impose, for example, FD, fair disclosure, which says that you can't give information to your friends unless you give it to the world at all, it's, has essentially led to a disruption of all information markets. So if you have to share the information you never created, so you have an equal playing field in which everybody's an ignoramus. So essentially <laughs> what you want to do is that's a classic non-discrimination regulation which doesn't realize that non-discrimination affects production of information and that unless you create it privately it will never work. There's a terrible decision in the Second Circuit about fly on the wall which exacerbates the same kind of problem. So as usual we're going in reverse in this particular market. Okay, next. Um, I'm Jay Schweikert. I'm a law clerk. Uh, my question is for Ms. Slavkin. Uh, I thought you were quite candid in acknowledging uh, some of the uh, failures of uh, even the sort of regulatory programs uh, adopted, perhaps with sort of the mindset that you hold. Uh, you acknowledge that a lot of regulators that we have now don't seem to have their interests properly aligned, that they're not doing their job. You acknowledge some uh, skepticism of Dodd-Frank and being unsure what it says, which I think at the very least matches some of the skepticism we heard at the opening panel this morning, even from those clearly from a, let's say, left of center perspective. My question, though, is, you know, following the financial crisis at a time when, uh, you know, both houses and the president were controlled by Democrats, in that environment of all environments, why wasn't it possible to create uh, a financial regulation um, scheme that satisfied even people that hold that perspective? At what point do you start acknowledging that the problem isn't, well, we just haven't quite gotten the right smart people together enough and they haven't quite put out the right statute, but rather at a structural level for all the you know, public choice problems that we're pretty well aware of now, the federal government simply can't do this kind of thing in the first place. It, what, what amount of failure would, can, would you need to decide <laughs> <laughs> that the problem isn't the problem is more structural than just failing to get the right bill passed. Um, I you've posed a question to me that offers me one of two choices, and I actually want to go in a third direction. Uh, <laughs> um, having been active in in the process of having conversations with Democratic and Republican legislators, people at the Department of Treasury and at the White House about the the structure of financial regulatory reform. My perspective on why we couldn't get it right is twofold. One is that there was that, that struggle between the, the concepts of do we want regulators to be supervisory 
and do we want real do we want fundamental structural reform of financial market institutions so that's one explanation and that's the generous explanation um, the second explanation I have is that we have a system right now where lobbyists who have been hired by institutions that have an interest in preventing effective financial regulation from coming into place are swarming the lawmakers every day. They are pumping them full of information and the people who are representative of the general public and the population don't have those resources to compete. And so what ends up happening is that the people who have the most to gain by ensuring that we don't have effective financial regulation are the ones that put the most resources on the table to prevent effective financial regulation from coming into being. And what we end up with is this gobbledygook of compromise between this lobbyist and that lobbyist that is then you know, punted to the regulators and the regulators are left looking at, at it and going, what do I do now? Yeah, and I think yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, system yeah. that we're seeing play okay. out right now as regulators try to implement Dodd-Frank. There's always a, a tendency, and, and I've plead guilty on many, many cases of this, of, of blaming, you know, the stupid regulators and the stupid legislators for not being able to, you know, to do what they should be doing. And then, you know, you, by, by transmission and translation, you go and blame uh, the smart lobbyists that go in and dupe the stupid regulators and the stupid legislators. The fact of the matter is in the financial crisis and every financial crisis that we've had in this country and another country which is going on in Europe today is a basic debasement of capital. And the market, because of the insurance mechanisms and the regulatory mechanisms and the belief in too big to fail and a whole bunch of other things, has abdicated its authority to demand appropriate capital standards so people operate without them. The government tries to step in and fill that void. They don't do a very good job of it. You know, capital wasn't even mentioned in the financial services reform bill. They passed that ball down the down the field to the to the Basel agreements. The oh, Fed God. sits and gets the Basel agreements back, and they turn around and say, "Hey, you know, we're going to stick the SIFIs mm. with three percent more capital because they do stuff that's, you know, systemically important." And you sit there and say, "Okay, but didn't you pass a Volcker rule in this thing that uh, that's supposed mm. to limit and prohibit and prescribe certain types of activities?" Well, yeah, but we don't really believe that's going to do any good, so we're all going to fall back on mm. capital and. They pick capital standards like this, okay? Yes. That's the problem when you have financial institutions operating without capital and you have a market that doesn't demand. I mean, what on earth went through the minds of the people that took those CDSs from, from AIG without any kind of assurance that there was going to be a counterparty payment if, if the situation blew up? But and no. we repeat it again and again and again and again and again, and they're repeating it in Europe right now. It always comes down to a debasement of capital, and the capital standards don't seem to figure in. So if we're not going to address the root cause of these problems, why, why should we have a whole bunch of other regulations that serve to, to uh, obviate the need for addressing the root cause? It um, just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I have two observations. One is implicit guarantees, which is what Marty's are throwing about, are the worst of all worlds, because A, they are real, and B, they are hard to price at the outset, and so what you do is inject another element of unnecessary uncertainty. And now I'm going to take the privilege. Uh, there are two people at this table who have something in common, and one person at this table, we put aside the judge, who doesn't. Um, uh, it was interesting to hear that Heather described about the lobbyist as if somehow or other the American labor movement is not part and parcel of that particular <laughs> problem. I mean, you know. I did I, not get the impression that she was seeking absolute. I didn't say, and, and by the way, and remember, I was being bipartisan because every time she's in the room, Marty's in the room, right? I mean, so the only That's guy it. who's absent is little old me because I don't represent anybody, uh, even myself on a bad day. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think that that's a problem. But I also think there's a structural problem here which we have to do. It. What, what is striking about the Dodd-Frank bill is this concerted administrative effort to essentially create independence from all political branches and then to stack the deck at the current time with the people who are appointed by the present incumbents. Uh, so if you look at that consumer financial fraud operation and so forth, it's supposed to be a person who heads this thing who's inside the Fed, but the Fed has no control over that individual, no control over that individual's budget. That person is put in office for not coincidentally five years, so if you're appointed in the Obama administration, the next administration 
Constitution has no say. The Democrats don't care because they already have them and the Republicans are apoplectic about it. And, and so what you do is you now see that it's not just kicking it downstairs, Heather. That would be a bad enough problem um, given the lack of expertise in many agencies today. But it's also structuring the agencies in a way so that if you have a small advantage at the legislative front, you can magnify that advantage when you get down inside the agency side. And, and this goes to essentially the fundamental decision that executive branch agencies uh, are no longer subject to a presidential power of removal. And that was essentially ratified by, in the PCOAB case or whatever it is, there's as much Republican support for the administrative state as Democratic support. And you got to go back to the notable railroad lawyer, Judge Sutherland, you know, George Sutherland, who started this in Humphreys' estate. And, and what's going on really is these guys are so good that they take each independent system which has been validated in one decision or another and they put them all in the same bill. And, and that means in effect that knowing that you have this kind of concentrated power in the hands of a single individual, what it does is it leads the Republicans now, quite rightly in my view, to say, um, we're not gonna let you appoint anybody whom you want. Uh, you have to appoint somebody that we like as well, and there is no such human being on the face of the globe <laughs> that meets that standard so that you now get these stalemates at the appointment level to negate the defective structures that have been put into place. And, and I, I mean, I don't know who Senator Dodd very well, uh, but I do know that well, his, he has no political you know, stature in my view. He has political savvy, and in this case, it's a very dangerous combination indeed. I hadn't noticed that the stalemate on appointment was a new thing, Richard. No, but it's getting no, I'm but it's sure getting it worse. Hadn't noticed when the NLRB was unable to function during the Bush administration. Yeah, we understand, but it's the in the last. Wouldn't let them get a quorum. Control. Yeah, it is five, and now they're going back to two. Um, that's essentially the problem of the New Deal model: is having specialized agencies with single capabilities it means that you know either you're for us or against us. And one of the advantages of doing this in federal courts is you got to appoint people whom you can't peg on every issue when you put them into office, so you at least have some chance of randomization. So I actually believe, and I hope John Centel will follow this advice, that you strike down as constitutional grounds, as a hopelessly biased tribunal, the NLRB, the FCC, all of these three, two agencies, because they cannot avoid the problem of inherent bias when the president gets the deciding vote. And the only difference between this and the financial stuff is that it's just a one to nothing vote instead of a three to two or a four to three vote, and that only exacerbates the problem. Can I actually challenge or raise a question with you? Sure, um, challenge. <laughs> Either one or both. <laughs> so you just raised an issue with all of the agencies that have three to two votes. Yes. At the same time, you're concerned about the CFPB, which would be headed by one person. That's so what is the, what's the right structure? Well, the, 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 it, uh, for the right structure is to go back to separation of powers. And you're willing to give the president the power to the extent that there's a political regime that he implements. Um, I don't care, one nothing, three two. But when you get to an adjudicative functions, which is what much of the stuff is going to take place here, then you do not want to create a system of special courts, um, which people are appointed by virtue of their loyalties on a single issue. So I didn't say abolish constitutionally the NLRB. Um, I just don't think it's healthy to have a situation where the general counsel and the president appoints the dominant and person inside the board where one is arguing to another on a case of first instance. So I want all of these cases to go to the federal district courts and if you're worried about one man having too much power in that case, then the correct thing to do is to say for certain kinds of issues you have three randomly chosen federal district court judges to hear the type of issues. And, and look, I mean, the Republicans are every bit as scandalous when it comes to this kind of game as the defendants. So as an outsider, it's just essentially, it's an attack on structure. It's not an attack on persons. I mean, you know, and, and I think it's really important that one understand that as we expand the size of government, the disabilities that we could live with in 1935 have become so enormous that we can no longer live with them today. Um, it's a real question, if you're trying to do this kind of nonsense with 10% of the economy, uh, you can walk. When you do it with 30% of the economy, by which I add direct expenditures plus implications by way of regulation, at that point these structures cut much more deeply and they're much more destructive. Next. Hi, I'm Christine Buzzard. I'm a current law student. I was interested in the story about uh, the physicist who skipped over the cost-benefit analysis. 
Um, and that is, how shall we say, inauspicious. But also I was wondering to what extent performing that cost-benefit analysis is our salvation. Because it seems like over the past couple of years we've learned that a professional value valuation expert is someone who does it for a living rather than always gets it right and even setting that aside there are any number of other variables of which we are not aware and therefore do not include and therefore label zero which can as we've also learned lead to very uh, very large swings in either direction that we did not anticipate so I was wondering first um, what you think about the cost-benefit analysis and whether or not that can help us and then also um, to what extent regulation has any power to help with this and, and I suspect the answer is it has very little power. Do you want me to take a shot at that one, Heather? Go ahead. I talked about cost-benefit analysis okay. already. Look, I mean, I think it's actually a very profound question and what it does is you want to design your institutions as a first approximation where the burden of cost-benefit analysis is placed upon private parties such that they internalize all the benefits and all the cost of those analyses so that you get rid of some of the political risks. So let's go back to the environmental stuff again. The way in which we work things today is we have variations on what is a cost-benefit analysis. And what happens is some government agency decides whether or not the cost of the benefits of putting up this particular plant are appropriate. And then they have a beast known as best available technology or BAT, which is BATI, in which you now try to figure out exactly how much more money you could spend for what kind of benefit. We are not doing a cost-benefit analysis, but you're worried about insolvency. The way to handle that question is, again, to reverse the priorities and to say, you build any kind of plant that you want, and what you know is that if the level of pollution that you create exceeds X, we're going to enjoin you down to the level of X, so that you use on the public side output measures which avoid the need to do the cost-benefit analysis, and then let the firms do the cost-benefit analysis, because I guarantee you, if you have a firm which has you know, a target of keeping it under X, they're not going to try to go to 0.9999X, because they know if there's any kind of measurement error, they risk a serious sanction, so they're going to have incentives to back away from that particular barrier. In addition, since they know what the barrier is, what you can then do under these circumstances is induce yourself to get better technology so the relationship of output of good things that you want to output of bad things like smog that you don't want will systematically be favored because there'll be no form of government intervention. And what happens under the EPA at every stage is it's an input-driven system. And that forces all the experts to get together in a political kind of an economy. And, and I dare say that you can do this with all sorts of other systems associated with liabilities. What you cannot do it with is the creation of public infrastructure projects. And there you're, the correct answer is, I think what you implicated or indicated, is one of the striking declines in the United States since I came into this business in 1968, is essentially that the political branches of government at the administrative level and everywhere else have overwhelmed what used to be a decent professional staff inside Congress and inside the agencies. The guys at the top say, this is what we have to find. You experts tell us what we get. And you have to create a different culture and a different set of ways to insulate these people. So essentially, you need a twofold form. Is one, get as much out of the cost-benefit world as you possibly can by using output measures, and then create some independent level of expertise. There's no substitute for decent public administration, except incompetent public administration, which seems to be what we specialize in these days. If Keynesianism worked, mm. if I, and by that I mean if, if massive government deficit spending could cure economic malaise and put an economy back on track, why isn't Greece the biggest success in the world? And if the answer to Greece by the Keynesians is, well, they're not really doing it right because they're mm. just paying a bunch of non-working civil servants, that's not real Keynesianism. You have to invest in capital assets or infrastructure or something like that. Then why isn't Japan a huge success with, with two decades of massive deficit spending and paving over the entire country? So, Well, that's I'm going to take a crack at that because <laughs> I'm not uh, a Keynesian per se, and I don't know necessarily who is, because the, what, you, what you paint is a very stylized Keynesian straw man uh, and then proceed to knock it down. I mean, right. Keynes was not one who said, hey, we should go out and have a public sector that's 60 percent of the economy. Okay? I, don't, I don't know anything. I have read the general theory. Uh, and uh, it's not while it's not, um, it's not 
you know, my economic Bible, I don't find that kind of, of uh, excessive uh, federal government reliance in, 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 the, in Keynes's doctrine. Keynes talked about instances where the market tended to fail and where uh, some third party uh, should come in and backstop it. And there's legitimate debate on does that work and how much does it work. I've heard a lot of talk about the current stimulus program and the fact that it didn't work at all. The fact of the matter is when the stimulus program was implemented, we were losing GDP at 6% annual rate. Uh, and a year later, we were growing at about 3% annual rate. All because of the stimulus? Absolutely not. Uh -huh. Was the stimulus designed well? Absolutely not. But to sit there and suggest that, that you can have that kind of government intervention, government spending, and it's a total failure, I think is an overstatement of the case. It's not something you want to rely on. In that particular case, um, the, the essence of the other types of government spending, like TARP, was not to stimulate the economy. It was to preserve the transmission mechanism. And anyone who studied finance and studied the history of the banking system knows that the difference between the 1929 crash and the onset of the Great Depression was a failure of the third or, or more of our banking system. And at that particular time, the banking system was the entire transmission mechanism. It is where trades were consummated. And you, if you can't consummate trades, you don't have a market economy. I think Bernanke looked at that model and said, hey, I think we ought to do something to try and preserve the mechanism, even if it does set bad precedents uh, in terms of too big to fail and like. That's a debatable issue, but I don't think you sit there and look at that and say, well, see, there's just an abject failure of Keynesianism. Uh, you know, Keynes was a market participant. He believed in the market. If you read the general theory, there's a quote in there that says, the job of professional investment is inexorably boring to anyone completely devoid of the gambling instinct, while he who has this propensity must pay to it the appropriate toll. Okay? He understood betting and failing and winning, okay, which is all about financial markets. And, and, and to sit there and stylize what he did and, and how he thought, I think, is, is, is incorrect. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not defending Keynes. What I'm trying to say is have a realistic assessment of what you mean when you say Keynesianism. Heather? Um, so, quickly, I want to, for perhaps the first time in my life, agree with everything that Marty just said and add two additional points. Um, you cited two examples. <laughs> no. Oh, come on. You, you cited two examples of, of countries that you believe implemented Keynesi oh, Keynesian policies that were failures. One is Japan, and the other was Greece. Um, in Japan, they, they did something that the U.S. is in the process of doing right now, which is allowed banks to zombie along and refuse to recognize their losses. And that, I believe, is one of the biggest reasons that they were unable to come out of the, their financial slump. Um, with Greece, they're implementing austerity measures right now. And as a result, I believe it's 12% that their GDP is expected to decline this year. We have, we're, we're at a, a point where we here in the United States are making a decision whether we want to go to the, the way of Greece. And I really hope that we don't. Um, I'm going to defend Keynes a little bit, too. Um, what happens is the public choice element, which he systematically disregarded, gets itself really intruded in these cases and encumbers the stimulus. But let me give you a Milton Ver Friedman version of the stimulus program, which is remarkably similar to Keynes. He has something known as the permanent income hypothesis, which says that you try to make sure that your level of consumption over all periods is roughly the same. And he also notes that it's difficult to do that when there are periods when you have peak incomes and small incomes. And what he says that you have to do in those periods in which there's personal slack is to borrow in order to spend, and in other periods what you do is you save for the rainy day. If you take that into the public sector, it bears at least some similarity towards a Keynesian stimulus program by saying, in effect, that you would like the government to spend more money than it earns so as to keep its activities up, even if it has to borrow. But that gets tied in with two other things which are completely non-Keynesian. One of them is the President, unfortunately, has tied the stimulus program to redistribution through the taxation system. That's just a complete misreading of Keynes. His emphasis was on aggregate demand. So as far as Keynes was concerned, if you could get the economy growing by having people with $2 million buy Gucci shoes by the carload, he would be just as happy to have that kind of expenditure as any other. The moment you put the redistribution stuff in there, the effect of that, either way, for the richer, for the poor, 
for is to, def to diffuse the level of the stimulus by making sure that some of this particular money is not going to spread. And the second thing that Keynes never said, which of course is part of the um, Greek disease and everything else, is secure public employment for non-performers. There's nothing whatsoever about Keynes which said that. I take it in its pure form is if you get a little bit higher government sp spending, you send it into the same unregulated employment markets that you would have had without the stimulus because they would be the ways in which most people would do it. What Keynes was worried about, and I don't think he answered the question, was he thought there was a clear failure of Say's law. And for those of you who forgot what that was, it's a situation in which you think that the natural forces of private markets are such that supply and demand will always be brought into equilibrium so that you will have no such thing as structural unemployment. And he looked around and he says, you know, there seems to be some real problems going on here. He did not have a diagnosis as to what was wrong, what was the source of that difficulty, and he tended to down play the neoclassical explanations that might have created this, that, and the other place by barriers to market entry of, of one form or another. Uh, but at least one understands where he's coming from. And frankly, if the only thing we had was a public sector today that was devoted to a modest Keynesian boost with none of the other bells and whistles on there, it may not help. But it's not going to hurt all that much. It's the other stuff which is permanent decline of capital formation as attributable to the secondary stuff, which is what brought Greece and what brought Japan down and will bring this country down if we can't separate the stimulus from the baggage. JB, if your question is a short one, you can put it. Otherwise, we're going to quit before it. All right, two words, student loans. God help us. <laughs> um, I mean, it's now greater than credit card debt. It's government subsidy. It's I mean, crazy. What should we do about this? How should we account for the loss? Uh, this, you're talking about Title IV loans, right? All student loans are yeah, I by mean, the government. Well, first of all, when they took them out of the private sector, the default rates skyrocketed. So we don't want that. And secondly, you cannot run a sane system in which, for example, for-profit institutions get 90% of their revenue from government subsidies. I would really want to cut this thing back disastrous, or dramatically so, because I think at that point, when people then go to school, they're going to be spending their own money, and they'll be much more selective the in the way to this. Next program is supposed to begin at 2 o'clock. No, we should get the hell out of here. I think right now. Well,